the answer to the problem for the take home example. Mm -hmm. uh, question two, you know, that, that short and sneaky way, really. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, the Freeman Dyson's way, yeah. Yeah, I didn't follow the argument um, where he said you could replace the side line. Because um, uh, the proof of the uh, reduction formula, I emphasize that to get the right S matrix by putting the Green's functions on the mass shell, all you needed to know was that the field had a non-zero matrix element between vacuum and the one particle state. Any otherwise, any local field is as good as any other. So psi prime is as good as psi as long as it. Uh, as long as it has a non-zero matrix element for making a one nucleon state, which of course it does in perturbation theory. Okay, all that, <clears throat> remember went through this long song and dance that multiplying by k squared minus mu squared and putting the lines on the mass shell and so on was just equivalent to hitting the vacuum with the field and extracting out the one particle part by a complicated sequence of limits, filtering out the one particle part. So it doesn't matter what field you use. If phi is a good field, so is phi plus phi to the 17 third. OK? Yes, Kay. Is this the example that you complete together like me? There's spinners or whatever Which ones? The two component vial spinners? or the four component ones. Your solution is to the Dirac equation, yeah, yes. Well, uh, well, you said it's how to apply Lorentz transformations to them. Yes. I'm all applying to my matrices. Do you use the same matrices for the Ds and for the Us? Yes, indeed you do. Uh -huh. The only difference is that a U, you get a different result for a moving V than for a moving U, but that's because you have a different result for a U at rest as, than, as opposed to a V at rest. Okay. okay. That's because they're both parts of psi, and there's a single matrix that multiplies psi, the field, when you make a Lorentz transform, and that single multi matrix multiplies the coefficients of its uh, Fourier expansion. There's no way you can get two different matrices in there, just because in one case you're looking at the positive frequency part, and in the other place you're looking at the negative frequency part. <coughs> other questions? Well, last lecture, I got a head start on one of the main topics of this semester by uh, giving the theory of a, a free uh, massive vector meson field. I'll, um, I would now like to talk about the, the classical theory. Well, actually, I would like to talk about three topics in this lecture, although I'll probably just get to the very beginnings of the third one. I'd like to first talk about the classical theory, the classical Lagrangian theory of a vector meson field in interaction with uh, other fields. If we think of the vector meson field as being massless and being the photon, or if we think it as being of it as being massive but with a very small mass and being the photon, that is to say I would like to discuss electro the interactions of electromagnetism with matter. And I will discuss three topics that turn out to be um, intimately related, gauge invariance for the massless case, a conserved current for the massive case, and uh, the so-called minimal coupling prescription. At the end of this discussion, we'll be in a position to write down uh, the interactions of electromagnetism with an arbitrary system, either with a free meson field or a free nucleon field or with interacting mesons and nucleon theories. We won't yet be in a position to write down the Feynman rules for such a theory, and that's because we will encounter, and I will try and sketch out, a large number of te purely technical problems, problems that are soluble by methods we have problems associated in one way or another with derivative couplings, which we'll encounter a lot of, which I've been avoiding discussing for some time, and uh, problems that are uh, certainly soluble by the methods we have. But if I attempted to solve them by the methods we have, I would be led into a sequence of uh, extremely complicated arguments, extremely narrow and complicated arguments. Uh, 
with com which would involve us in a large number of combinatoric calisthenics that I would just as soon avoid. And therefore, I will stop the discussion at this stage and begin describing a new technique, a new technique of great generality, which we will apply to solve these problems and also to solve some more com problems of similar sort, but even greater combinatorial complexity that arise in some even more complicated theories we'll talk about later on. That is to say, the method of functional integrals. And I will probably just begin discussing that method this lecture and finish up discussing it next lecture. And then at the beginning of next week, return to these theories and use the functional integral method to derive the Feynman rules for them. So that's the outline of what we're going to do. <coughs> now, <coughs> To remind you of what we were of the system we studied last time, we had a um, Lagrangian density of the form minus one quarter f mu nu f mu nu plus mu squared over two a mu a mu plus possibly at the very end of the lecture I discussed an interaction with an external current and I see from my notes it was minus j mu a mu, where j mu is some c number function of space and time. But this let us, f mu nu is shorthand for d nu a mu minus d mu a nu. I fear I will keep writing it down um, the wrong way. No, that's the way Bjorken and Jarrell do it. It's the opposite of the way I always do it in my papers. <laughs> F mu nu is that. And the equation of motion you get from varying this Lagrangian is d nu F mu nu plus mu squared A mu equals J mu. Uh, we discovered, I observed last time, that by a trivial argument taking the divergence of this equation, we find, found we can get a smooth limit as mu squared equals zero. If d mu j mu equals zero, that is to say if the vector meson is coupled to a conserved current, and indeed, considering the emission of a single meson by this current acting on the vacuum, we discovered a very interesting fact that of the three helicity states of a massive vector meson, one of them completely decoupled. There was no amplitude for it to be emitted as, as the mass went to zero. The amplitude for emitting it went down, as one, went down linearly with the mass. Now, I would now like to consider a um, more general kind of theory in which L, well, write out in full, has the same free form as before, but there is an interaction of our vector meson with something else, scalar mesons, nucleons, what have you. I will represent the fields involved here generically by a big vector phi. In order to not write a lot of indices, I'll just assemble them all together in some enormous column vector, psi and psi star and the pion fields and the proton fields and whatever. And possibly also, of course, a mu, so there's some interaction. <laughs> Maybe the derivatives of a mu also. Of course, by varying this equation, since I don't know what L prime is, uh, I don't know what happens when I vary this Lagrangian, except I know what happens from these two terms. I'll obtain d mu f mu nu plus mu squared a mu equals something I get from varying L prime with respect to a mu, which I'll call j mu. It's the same equation as before, but now j mu is a complicated, is not an external given source, but some complicated function of phi and d mu phi and maybe even a mu and, it's, and so on. <coughs> In the massive theory, 
since I discovered it was a nice thing with an, an external source, the theory with mu squared not equal zero, I would like to arrange matters so that d mu j mu equals zero. So the current, if I can call it that, it's a four vector field after all, and it is the electromagnetic current in the massless case, is conserved. Obviously, a priori, I could couple this thing in in many possible ways, but only some of them will yield a coupling such that this comes out as a consequence of the Heisenberg equations of motion of the theory. And I would like to find ways of coupling the current to, to the amu to these things so that this is true. A, uh, in the massive, massless case, of course, gauge invariance kept us from, uh, sorry, of course, we had trouble with canonical quantization there, but on a classical level, we can discuss the theory with mu squared equals zero. Uh, we have what is apparently a different and um, apparently unrelated problem, the problem of gauge invariance. As I pointed out at the end of last lecture, The, uh, these equations are, in fact, Maxwell's equations in covariant form when the mass vanishes with the components of the anti-symmetric tensor F mu nu identified with the electric and magnetic fields. Now, we know that in electromagnetism, one of the standard dogmas is all there is is the electric and magnetic field. The potentials don't make any difference. And in particular, you can take the scalar and vector potentials here assembled into a, um, a four vector, a mu, and add to them the derivative of any arbitrary function of space and time. This transformation, of course, does not affect f mu nu, which is the only real thing. Phrase in terms of infinitesimal transformations, if I make an infinitesimal variation of a mu, which is d mu of something I'll call delta psi, an infinitesimal psi function, then in particular, minus one quarter f mu nu squared, the free Lagrangian is unchanged. This is the so-called gauge invariance of the theory. You can always, uh, for free electromagnetism, and indeed for Maxwell's classical theory, you can always arrange matters. Uh, how you choose this function psi is a matter of taste. You may choose this so you are doing your electromagnetic theory in Coulomb gauge. You may choose this so you are doing it in Lorentz gauge. You may choose this so you are doing it in some other random gauge. It don't matter. Nobody believes, nobody ever reads a paper on which someone has done an experiment involving photons with a footnote that says this experiment was done in Coulomb gauge. <laughs> <laughs> now, because of this empirical fact, one would like to arrange matters so that L prime, whatever it is, has the property that under the same transformation, well, Let's just say something. We have all these other fields, phi, in the theory. We may wish to assign some transformation property to them under a gauge transformation. We don't know what it is. But suppose we would like to assign some transformation properties to them, such that when everything does this transformation, delta L prime is also 0. That is, the A's transform this way, and the phi's transform in some other way, which we're trying to discover. Thus, rep thus um, um, preserving in the interacting theory this desirable property of free electromagnetism that it doesn't matter what gauge you do the theory in. Is this argument clear? I stumbled over my sentences at several stages, so some people may have become confused. Yes? I have a question from when you were done the Lagrangian. All kinds of fields, three Lagrangians and five fields. Yes, everything. The whole works, whatever else there is, the remainder. Now, <clears throat> these questions, as I say, are apparently unrelated. There is uh, the problem of uh, getting a conserved current in the massive case, the case of a massive photon, and preserving gauge invariance in the case of a massless photon. 
I will now show that, in fact, they have, though they look like they're unrelated, they have the same solution. In particular, I will show that an L prime that satisfies this will also satisfy the condition of generating a conserved current. The uh, point is simple. I consider L equals minus one quarter F mu nu, F mu nu, plus mu squared over two A mu, A mu, plus L prime. I presume I have concocted L prime and assigned some transformation properties to phi, such that L prime is gauge invariant. I then make this transformation, delta A mu equals D mu delta chi, delta phi equals something, which I'll have to figure out what it is, but I presume I've solved that problem and figured out what it is, and compute delta L. I don't have to know how phi transforms explicitly because by assumption I have arranged matter so that delta L prime equals zero. This term is invariant. This term is of course not. So I obtain mu squared A mu D mu delta chi. From this term here, the only non-gauge invariant term in the theory by assumption. Now, Hamilton's principle tells me that the change in the action, which is the integral d4x of delta L, equals 0 for arbitrary variations of the fields vanishing on the boundaries of the region of integration. In particular, I can always choose delta chi that vanish on the boundaries of the region of integration. So I obtain this is mu squared. <coughs> A mu, D mu delta chi. Integrating by parts and choosing delta chi, for example, to be a four-dimensional delta function, I obtain as a consequence of Hamilton's principle, that is to say of the Euler-Lagrange equations of motion, D mu A mu equals zero, since delta chi is arbitrary. Now we return to the definition of J nu over here. I know the equations of motion must apply, imply that d mu a mu equals zero. I've just demonstrated it. I also know that the d nu f mu nu plus mu squared a nu uh, a mu, excuse me, equals j mu. That's the definition of j mu. I therefore take d mu of this expression. I know d mu d nu, f mu nu is zero just because f mu nu is anti-symmetric. I know d mu a mu equals zero because I've just proved it. And therefore, I know that d mu j mu must equal 0 as a consequence of the equations of motion. Thus, the two problems, in fact, have a single solution. The solution to one is the solution to the other. If I can arrange my interaction such as a consequence such that my, uh, if I can f arrange L prime such that um, the, um, equations of uh, motion give me a concern uh, uh, such that L prime is gauge invariant, and that if I break gauge invariance only by giving the photon a mass, I will obtain a conserved current in the massive case. To solve one problem is to solve, to solve the gauge invariance problem for the massless photon is to solve the conserved current problem for the massive photon. Okay. It's straightforward algebra. It's all on the board, but still there may be questions. If there are, please ask them. Yes? Uh, for the massless photon, uh, you have gauge invariance as a symmetry. What is the conserved current associated with that? No, it is not a symmetry. The conserved current associated with it is zero. Oh, and the gauge invariance for the massless photon is not a symmetry? No, uh, gauge invariance, uh, how should I put it? There is a big difference between gauge invariance and an internal symmetry like, say, an isospin rotation in the isospin symmetric theory of pions and nucleons. Um, 
when I, um, there is a difference between a proton and a neutron. They're turned into each other by an isospin rotation. There is no difference between uh, the state of the electromagnetic field described in Lorentz gauge and a state of the electromagnetic field described in Coulomb gauge. <laughs> no physical difference. Gauge invariance is uh, like a general coordinate invariance in general relativity, or like the statement that the contents of a physics paper are unchanged if it is translated from English into French. <laughs> it connects different descriptions of the same system, not different systems with symmetric dynamics. Okay. It's a, um, is, is a, I mean, I mean, that should be clear to you from, that's not clear, of course, from the analytic structure of the thing, but that's the meaning we attach to that physics traditionally in both cases. That, okay. I mean, we could test the isospin symmetry of the world, assuming there were no electromagnetism, by doing proton-proton scattering and then doing neutron-neutron scattering. And you would get two physics papers, one saying proton-proton scattering at 300 BeV, and the other saying neutron-neutron scattering at 300 BeV, and they would produce the same cross-sections, and that would be a test. Okay, uh, you can't, as I say, get a physics paper that says photon-electron scattering in Coulomb gauge and photon-electron scattering mm -hmm. in Lorentz gauge. <laughs> Observe, you get the same cross-sections and say you have verified gauge invariance. Yes? Yeah, I'm a little confused. Couldn't we run the whole argument backwards and start with matter field and get the gauge to the matter field? I would prefer you postpone that question until I discuss the second thing, the minimal coupling assumption, and then if you still have it, uh, I'll have more information. I'll be able to answer it without explaining more things in words. Uh, yes? A small question. Do you have, uh, can you first work on your gauge information? Yeah. No, this is the infinitesimal version of this. If chi is infinitesimal and I stick a delta on it, the infinitesimal change in a mu is d mu delta chi, and this is the finite gauge transformation. Yes? I've shown that if the interaction Lagrangian, L prime, I shouldn't call it interaction because this was pointed out, it includes the free Lagrangian for phi. If L prime is gauge invariant, is chosen to be gauge invariant, that has the desirable property of preserving the gauge invariance of massless electrodynamics with a massless photon. And as a consequence of that, if we break gauge invariance just by adding a photon mass term, then in the massive case, we obtain a massive vector meson coupled to a conserved current. Yes, sir? You get zero for the. You get zero equals zero. Um, how should I put it? <clears throat> the canonical momentum conjugate to a gauge transformation is zero the pi mu that appears in pi mu d phi for the massless case is, is zero. Simply because the Lagrangian doesn't change at all. It's identically zero. It's identically zero, yeah. Yeah. Now, I would now like to tackle the problem of constructing a gauge invariant Lagrangian. I will not give a general prescription for doing it. I will, do a pre I will give a prescription only if you start out with a theory. Well, sorry. I'll start out with a theory of a group of fields, scalar, spinner, vector, whatever phi of d mu phi, and I will give a prescription that will generate from this a Lagrangian that it will turn out will not involve the derivatives of a, just a mu, satisfying our gauge invariance condition. This will not be true for a um, 
I will not give a prescription. This will be called the minimal coupling prescription. I'll explain at the end where the word minimal comes from. It's a machine. You give me a you give me a Lagrangian for matter or whatever you want to call it, interacting without electromagnetism, and I generate the Lagrangian, including the interactions with electromagnetism. It is not applicable to a general Lagrangian. It, the necessary condition for the starting Lagrangian is that it has a one-parameter group of internal symmetries. That is to say, of the usual sort, there is some infinitesimal variation of phi corresponding to the sort of internal symmetries we have been discussing. Q phi delta lambda, where Q is a matrix. And this is just a constant infinitesimal parameter I stick in there, such that the change in L equals 0. This is the sort of transformation that, under normal circumstances, would enable us to deduce the existence of a conserved current, pi mu Q phi. And um, uh, that seems a reasonable, necessary condition to get something like this, because you could imagine if the photon has some coupling constant or something, the electromagnetic coupling constant, and if you have a conserved current when a photon is around, it should stay conserved as the electromagnetic current goes to zero. So you want to have, a, you know, start out with something that has a conserved current before you stick the photon in. Anyway, whether you think it's a reasonable assumption or not, this is the assumption I will make on this Lagrangian. Q is some matrix, which, of course, since it's just a single matrix, we can diagonalize. For example, if we take, I'll give two examples. M psi, a free uh, Dirac field, then uh, Q on psi, as we normally call it is minus i psi. Psi is an eigenstate of the matrix Q with eigenvalue minus i. And Q on psi bar equals i psi bar. That's the definition of the matrix Q. If we assemble psi and psi bar into a two-component vector, Q has eigenvalues plus i and minus i. OK? I don't know why I called it Q. That makes it possible for you to confuse it with the charge. It's got nothing to do with it the charge. Likewise, each, each second example, a free scalar meson charged. Again, I call it psi, although it's just a scalar field here. Again, Q on psi is minus I psi. Q on psi star equals I psi star. <coughs> the, um, I will now demonstrate how to uh, construct such a, um, how to assign gauge transformation properties to these fields using Q and how to construct a Lagrangian that has the desired possibilities. To begin with, I would like to consider a transformation of exactly the same form as before, but with delta lambda, now a arbitrary function of space and time. That's, of course, not an invariance of our Lagrangian. Because as if I compute delta d mu phi, I'll get q d mu phi delta lambda. That, of course, is hunky-dory. There's no problem there. But I'll also get q phi uh, d mu delta lambda. And that's a disaster. However, we've also got around in the business the electromagnetic field, which under gauge transformations 
obeys uh, this rule. Now I've got to get my signs right. Did I use a minus sign or a plus sign to agree with Bjork, Kane, and Drell? <laughs> now, let me, yeah, I used a minus sign. Therefore, let me construct the following combination, which I'll call capital D mu phi. This is equal to phi, sorry, the ordinary derivative of phi, minus some free parameter, which will shortly turn out to be the electromagnetic coupling constant, E Q A mu phi. That's just a definition. Now, let me consider delta D mu phi. <coughs> well, perhaps I'd better consider it at the top of the next board, since otherwise I'll run into the chalk trait when I run out the equation. This is just a random computation at the moment, but we'll see what's going to happen. Some of you are already smiling, so I see you see what's going to happen. <laughs> I'll, of course, get from the terms not involving the derivative of uh, lambda, I'll get d mu phi times a q matrix times delta lambda. Then there'll be terms that come from the derivative of lambda in the first term. And that will give me plus uh, q phi d mu delta lambda. That's just the term before. And finally, there'll be a term coming from a mu, which will be minus e q phi And the change in a mu is d mu delta chi. Now we can make these two last terms cancel if we choose delta lambda equals e delta chi. Then this term and this term cancel off against each other. Thus we have arranged, we have assigned a gauge transformation properties to these fields phi. There it is. It's, this is how they gauge transform with delta lambda equals E delta chi. And we have arranged matters so that the following structure, the same function, If we define the original Lagrangian of phi, and now with the ordinary derivative replaced by this object, sometimes called the gauge covariant derivative, this thing is gauge invariant. This is the so-called minimal coupling prescription. Okay, I've obtained it by sequence of algebraic magic steps. But there should be no doubt that the result, although unmotivated at any given stage, miraculously ended up with the right answer that satisfies all the desired criteria. You give me a theory that is invariant under some infinitesimal internal symmetry, I will give you a theory that is gauge invariant by this rule. Any questions? Yes, sir. I got these two terms. I verify here. There are two terms. This first term here has got two terms in it when I write out d mu phi. d mu phi is the ordinary derivative of phi, and that's the get the term from varying the phi here, and this thing, and that's the t q, of course, commutes with q, whether it's on the inside or the outside, doesn't matter. Okay. Other questions? Now, let's actually apply this to the two examples at hand. Of course, it's a universal prescription. It would work just as well for meson nucleon theory or anything else. 
as long as the theory has a one parameter internal symmetry. I should write down, oh, here's the definition of d mu phi, perhaps so I don't, so I can erase that. I'll write this out more fully. L of phi, d mu phi, minus, is it minus? Yes, e q a mu phi. Now I have two examples on at hand. You can now actually forget about the gauge invariance and what it does. I have two examples at hand, so let me do them one after the other. Example one. Here I have, the only thing that's being differentiated here is psi. Q acting on psi is minus I psi. So I've got minus I from, well, let me write it down. I, d slash, that's the thing that's going to change. It's acting on psi. Q is minus I on psi, so I have plus E I, A mu. And then there is still the M term, which doesn't get changed because that doesn't have any derivatives in it, psi. Uh, a, a, not a mu, a mu sla a slash, because I've taken d mu and replaced it by d mu minus i e, plus i e a mu. Thus I obtain psi bar i d slash minus m, let's say l prime, there's also the free electromagnetic part, psi, plus minus e a mu psi bar gamma mu psi. The j mu, as we've defined it before, remember this is minus e a mu j mu. j mu is what you get by making the derivative with respect to a mu. j mu is therefore e psi bar gamma mu psi, aside from a scale the same as the conserved current we had in the non-interacting theory. Any questions about this being an application of the prescription which I derived five minutes ago? Something more interesting happens in the scalar case. Here we have it. We've got both a d mu psi and a d mu psi star. And one gets a minus i and the other gets a plus i. So I get L prime equals d mu, see my rule was minus e a mu q, and q acting on psi star is i. That's the minimal substitution for the d mu psi star. And of course, the psi star psi term is free of derivatives and is unchanged. <coughs> Notice in this case, there is a derivative coupling of a mu to psi, a mu psi star d mu psi, and the other term. In addition, the minimal coupling prescription has generated a quadratic non-derivative interaction, e squared a mu squared psi star psi. So in its detailed structure, the electrodynamics of charged scalar particles is very different from that of charged spinner particles. The sort of Feynman rules we'll get eventually will be quite different. Nevertheless, it's the same prescription you give me the Lagrangian that has a conserved current in the absence of electromagnetism, I will generate the gauge invariant Lagrangian that describes the coupling to it with electromagnetism. <coughs> the electromagnetic current in this case, the thing you get by differentiating this with respect to a mu and putting in a minus sign, 
is rather more complicated from this term here. I just pick it because it sits there first. Psi star d mu plus i e a mu psi minus uh, no, I don't. I'm differentiating with respect to this a mu. So this one is still sitting there. Yeah, and I put the index in the wrong place. No, no, no. What I mean is, uh, I've differentiated with respect to this a mu. The first term is the second, the second bracket that we see on the bottom. Oh, yes. I'm terribly sorry. I always have troubles with that. Now differentiating with respect to a mu here, and of course lowering the indices to make the definition, minus i e d mu minus i e a mu psi star times psi. Please notice the terms linear and a mu do not cancel. The electromagnetic current has an a mu in it. Of course, you could say it's got to have an amu in it to be gauge invariant, because um, this thing could also be written as IE psi star d mu psi minus d mu psi star times psi. If it didn't have an amu in it and it had a derivative of a field in it, it couldn't be gauge invariant. <laughs> This makes it gauge invariant. Notice, aside from the corrections that are required to make the electromagnetic current a gauge invariant object, this is of the same form as the conserved current in the non-interacting case. Yeah. Are there any questions about this manipulation? In this case, it is not at all easy to see that this is a conserved current. You've got to use the equations of motion hard. But of course, it is a conserved current. <laughs> Any questions? I see a, a sea of glazed eyeballs. <laughs> Am I going too slow? OK. Everyone has seen this before. So I shan't, I shan't make my further remark. Oh, one further remark. Non-minimal couplings are, of course, possible. It is possible to add additional terms that um, uh, preserve gauge invariance and are not generated for this prescription. For example, in example one, I could add an interaction of the form f mu nu psi bar sigma mu nu psi. That's perfectly gauge invariant. f mu nu is gauge invariant, and psi bar sigma mu nu psi is gauge invariant without any, any funny business. It doesn't involve any derivatives. And uh, there it is. So that's why minimal coupling is called minimal coupling. You can always complicate matters by adding on additional terms that are gauge invariant and therefore yield to conserve cur yield conserved currents. For four-dimensional theories, we typically will not have to worry about these non-minimal interactions because they typically, in particular this one, in fact, turns out to be non-renormalizable. However, since we have not discussed the renormalization problem for electrodynamics yet, we haven't even got the propagator for the free photon. This is a premature remark. I make it anyway. Now, I said I would discuss three topics. One is uh, gauge invariance, minimal coupling, and conserved current. And I've gone through that, or everything, except there was someone who had a question earlier. You. Do you want to ask that question now, or is it, was it answered in the course of my? OK. I would now like to turn to the second topic, which is technical problems. I mean, in principle, everything is all set up. We know what our interactions are. We have this gigantic machine, canonical quantization with canonical commutators for uh, bosons and anti-commutators for fermions. All we have to do is grind through this machine, develop a Hamiltonian, write down Dyson's formula, apply Wick's theorem, get Feynman rules, you do, use the renormalization prescriptions, and pull out the S-matrix and happily begin computing, say, the anomalous magnetic moment of the electron to order e to the eighth. Now, why, <laughs> why am I not going to launch onto that, onto that progression? 
Well, things get pretty complicated, and I'd like to explore. There are, in fact, three reasons. why they get complicated. They're all technical complications. None of them are insuperable. None of them really require the panacea that will emerge in 20 minutes or so. But uh, they all lead us into horrendous complications. One is <clears throat> the problem of gauge invariance, which arises when mu squared equals 0. You remember that for mu squared, not equals, for mu squared not equal to zero, we had no problem last lecture canonically quantizing the massive photon. We had no problem canonically quantizing the free field theory. However, for mu squared equals zero, the canonical quantization program came to a screeching halt. We couldn't do it. <clears throat> there is a reason for this, which we can, I can now reveal. The reason is gauge invariance. The canonical quantization program, or indeed the Hamiltonian formulation of classical mechanics, depends on having a complete and independent set of initial value data. You tell me, for example, in massive uh, vector meson theory, the three AIs and the three F0Is at time zero, and I will tell you by solving the equations of motion what they are at any future time. Now, this is obviously an impossible thing to do with a theory that has gauge invariance no matter how many variables you pick at time zero. For you have picked the variable, suppose you claim to be able to solve the initial value problem. Say, you give me the fields in the first 32 derivatives at time t equals zero, and I will tell you the fields at all future times. In a gauge invariant theory, that's an obvious impossibility. Because I have the perfect freedom to make a gauge transformation, which is zero at time zero, or indeed, for a little slice of width epsilon around time zero, and non-zero at time one. Therefore, I have exactly the same initial value data, exactly the same fields in all their time derivatives at time zero, and I have a completely different set of fields at time one. So you can't possibly get a unique solution to the initial value problem, and you can't possibly write the theory in Hamiltonian form. Just a consequence of gauge invariance. It wasn't that we were stupid. We were trying to do something impossible last lecture. This is a problem, which we will solve, but it is a problem. Problem two is a problem I have alluded to. many times, the problem of derivative couplings. We uh, never, we always, uh, I was always sort of itchy, or antsy, I should say, sort of antsy about the question of derivative couplings whenever it came up in these lectures. I said, well, we'll talk about that later. The uh, standard um, um, Tricks we used can, of course, be applied to theories with derivative couplings, and we will have to confront theories with derivative couplings, like scalar electrodynamics here. But they lead to a terrible mess. And let me explain. I'll now take 10 minutes to talk about this and to work out some detailed equations, just so you stand on the precipice looking into this canyon full of garbage. <laughs> and <laughs> before I pull back, exactly what would happen, what sort of problems we would run into, if we try to seriously do, in our canonical way, theory with derivative couplings. Just to avoid writing down a lot of indices, instead of either of these theories, I'll take a theory which I gave you on the test, which is a theory with derivative couplings, the theory of a um, A spinner field interacting <laughs> with a meson field via this interaction with some coupling constant f. I think I, I called it f over mu there, but that's irrelevant to uh, what I'm going to do. This combination will come up again and again, and I'll just call it KMU to have a name for it so I don't have to continually write sidebars and size. 
<coughs> now, let's try and write this theory in Hamiltonian form. This has none of the special problems of electromagnetism. There's no canonical momentum conjugates a psi bar, but we don't care about that. The canonical momentum conjugates a psi is, as always, I psi bar gamma naught. No problem there. The canonical momentum conjugate to phi, however, looks a little funny. We get d naught phi from the free phi Lagrangian, but from the interaction, we get f k naught. Because that is what term multiplying d naught phi, and when we differentiate the Lagrangian with respect to d naught phi, that is a term we get. This means that the interaction Hamiltonian will not be minus the interaction Lagrangian because of the presence of this extra term here. To be more explicit, if we focus on the terms in the formula for the Hamiltonian that involve time derivatives of phi, we'll find, firstly, the term pi phi d naught phi will be pi phi pi phi minus f k naught. Not simply pi phi squared, which is what it would be if we had a non-derivative interaction. Secondly, the terms in the Lagrangian involving time derivatives of phi, which are 1 half d naught phi squared plus f d naught phi k naught, k upper naught or k lower naught, of course, doesn't matter, can be written as 1 half d naught phi plus f k naught squared minus 1 half f squared k naught squared, <coughs> or 1 half pi phi squared, what we would have if there were non-derivative interactions, minus 1 half f squared k naught squared. Thus, when we assemble a Hamiltonian, using the standard formula, minus L. All of the terms not involving the derivative of phi will, of course, uh, get, come together and give us the free Hamiltonian for the scalar and vector fields, a uh, scalar and the spinner fields. The uh, non-derivative interaction term here, involving just base derivatives, will give us minus F di phi k upper i. We haven't done anything of that. And now these funny extra terms involving the time derivatives. From here, I'll get a minus, well, let's see. From here, I'll get minus f k naught d naught phi. That's great. That comes from, oh, sorry, not d naught phi. What am I saying? Pi phi. That's great. And now from the extra term here, this comes in with a minus sign. Since this is a term in the Lagrangian, I'll get plus 1 half f squared k naught squared. So that is the form of the Hamiltonian, written in terms of pi's of fields and their canonical momenta. It's the free Hamiltonian plus this, plus this, plus this. Now. In Dyson's formula, you're interested in h sub i, which is the interaction Hamiltonian density in the interaction picture, written as a function of interaction picture fields. This di phi i, I'll put a big i on it just to remind you, these are also functions of the interaction picture fields. In the interaction picture, pi phi is, of course, d naught phi i because that's one of the interaction picture equations of motion. Now, these two 
terms combine together nicely to give us minus f d mu phi i k mu. Nice Lorentz invariant object to go up there in the exponential. Great. But this thing, this little bastard, doesn't cancel out. <laughs> it's there. It's as disgustingly non-Lorentz invariant as an object can be. And it's sitting there in the interaction Hamiltonian in the exponential in Dyson's formula. Psi adjoint psi, psi adjoint gamma 5 psi, quantity squared, just there, giving us a terrible, it looks like a terrible non-Lorentz invariant four-point vertex involving four Fermi fields in our Feynman rules. Yes? Is there something wrong here? You have three mu's there in the same power. Indeed. One of them is a ghost of a previous equation. It was, <laughs> it was hang, hanging on to a capital D mu that I only partially erased. And there, I erased an I. That should have been there while I was there. <clears throat> now, this is not the only difficulty that would come up in this theory. Um, we have this four Fermi non-covariant term in our interaction Hamiltonian in the interaction picture. We also have, in fact, a non-covariant contraction function, as I will demonstrate. Um, I remind you of the definition of a time-ordered product of two operators. Theta of x minus y, naught. A of x, b of y, plus theta of y naught minus x naught, b of y, a of x, assuming these are Bosch operators, of course. Now, if I was, suppose I wanted to compute the x time derivative of this thing. From differentiating the field operators, I, of course, obtain simply the time-ordered product of d naught a of x, b of y. Couldn't be nicer. However, when I differentiate the theta functions, I get a delta function. So I get plus delta of x naught minus y naught a of x b of y minus, because it's the other theta function, delta of x naught minus y naught, b of y, a of x. Or equivalently, time-ordered product d naught a of x, b of y, plus delta of, of x naught minus y naught, commutator a of x, b of y. This is a trivial algebraic identity, which in fact was used, in the, I believe, in the distributed solution to homework problem number one last semester, when you were asked to prove that uh, the propagator for a free scalar field was a Green's function for the Klein-Gordon equation. Now, in the theory we wish to consider here, our interaction Hamiltonian not only involves phi's, but also involves time derivatives of phi's. So we'll have to compute the contraction function for two time derivatives of phi's, which we will do using this identity. The contraction function is, of course, the vacuum expectation value of the time-ordered product, so I might as well work with the time-ordered product. Let's consider d naught with respect to x, d naught with respect to y, time ordered product phi of x, phi of y. So let's first bring the y time derivative through. We can do that with no problems because the equal time commutator that develops is the equal time commutator of phi with phi, which is 0. So I've still got d naught x, t, 
phi of x d naught phi of y. However, when I try and bring the x time derivative through, the extra term, the commutator at equal times, the last term written down on the left-hand board, is non-zero. And I'll get <coughs> plus delta of x naught minus y naught pi with phi is minus i delta cubed of x minus y at equal times. Any questions? These are, of course, free fields, interaction picture fields. Perhaps to make that clear, I should put an eye on them. <laughs> Thus, we have a rather peculiar equation that we'll have to also feed into our Feynman rules in computing the contraction functions of two d mu phi i's with d nu phi i is a sort of contraction we would have to worry about. Sticking, there's no problem with the space terms, so sticking things onto the other side. Equals d mu x, d nu y, time ordered phi i of x, do we have a non-covariant interaction Hamiltonian? We have a non-covariant equal time, we have a non-covariant contraction function. This is a nice co covariant object. This has just got the same Fourier transform as the other things with a couple of k's in the numerator because the derivatives are outside. But then we got this extra term which is disgusto. Now of course, it should be, this is why I have led you to the ed edge of the precipice, but I'm not going to plunge into that pit of garbage, as I said. <laughs> yeah, of course, these two diseases turn out to be each other's cure. It is, after all, Lorentz invariant theory. You must get a Lorentz invariant answer finally. It turns out that this disgusting term here cancels this disgusting term here <laughs> when you, after, a horrendous amount of combinatorics. It's the horrendous amount of combinatorics that I'm not going to do. But I've led you to the edge of the situation where you can see the sort of problems we would have to deal with if we attempted to treat this theory in a straightforward way. It can be treated in this way, and we can get all the final answers, which are the answers I told you on the homework problem. You just forget about this problem and forget about this problem, and it's all OK. <laughs> but on um, the homework problem, on the test problem. But uh, still, to uh, redeem that promise, to show that that was a correct assertion, is obviously going to require a lot of work. Are there any questions about this? Yes? I get squeamish when you multiply singular distributions by beta functions. Mm. Are, are the derivatives of the um, propagators sing, uh, Enough, yeah, in this case, it's there. So, so it's obvious in Fourier space. This is just a Fourier transform of uh, k mu, k nu, over 1 over k squared minus mu squared. And this is just the Fourier transform of 1. It couldn't be nicer. So, but the, the time word product that you, that you bring down is unambiguous. Yes, it is unambiguous. There is no problem. We will later see that there is never a problem because what in f the formalism we will finally develop will secretly have us doing all of our Feynman integrals in uh, Euclidean space. And only when we're done with everything analytically continuing back to Minkowski space. And in Euclidean space, none of the denominators ever vanish because it's always k, k squared minus mu squared becomes k squared plus mu squared after you make the rotation to Euclidean space to imaginary energies. And in fact, our uh, Green's functions are not distributions in Euclidean space. They're actually analytic functions. Oh, we still have the ultraviolet problems. Yeah, and you've got to put in a cutoff for that. But I mean, even, even not computing time and that just computing propagated aren't there time and the small distance of the multiplying and beta function by? Oh, yes. Yes, there are. But in this case, they do not. This case is not so singular that they arise. And in general, for, for you will see. 
that's not a sort of problem you have to worry about in advance because when it occurs, it hits you in the face. <laughs> you reach an expression that's evidently ambiguous. In this case, we have not reached such an expression. Everything is okay. <laughs> Take my word for it. Father knows best, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Now, the third technical difficulty is actually the same difficulty coming out over again if we attempt to uh, actually compute the propagator or um, the Hamiltonian for even the massive photon field. As you recall, we ha when we were doing the free field theory, we had to eliminate a0 from Lagrangian before we could write down the Hamiltonian. And the equation that eliminated it was the field equation evaluated from mu equals 0. Now in an interacting theory, we'll have the modified field equation where this will now be a function of uh, all those charged particle fields in the theory. And therefore, the equation we will have is mu squared a naught equals minus di f zero i plus j naught. Therefore, in the course of eliminating a naught from the theory, when we get all those a naught squared terms and so on, they'll introduce terms in the interaction Hamiltonian of the form j naught squared from squaring a naught just like those ugly k naught squared terms we've got here. Likewise, when computing the a naught propagator, the a naught with a naught contraction function, because a naught is related to a canonical momentum, we'll have exactly the same sort of problems we had when we were computing d naught phi with d naught phi. A naught is related to the time derivative of a i. And if we attempt to compute the a naught a naught propagator, we'll get non-covariant terms there for the same reason we got non-covariant terms in the previous example. So this is, in fact, even spinner electrodynamics with a massive photon, where we apparently have none of the other problems, in the course of eliminating a naught in order to set the theory up in Hamiltonian form, we turn out to have a theory that gives us almost as many troubles as the theories with derivative interactions. Okay, simply because A naught is in fact, this a momentum density, is in fact related to a momentum density, just like D naught phi, and squaring this term will give us a non-covariant interaction. So, it looks like we have a lot of problems. None of them are problems that are insuperable in principle. If we just kept the faith, plugged along, did all our combinatorics right, and brushed our teeth every morning and evening, we would no doubt arise at the right answer because we know how to do things. It just gets messier and messier. And nevertheless, this is a good point for me to break off the discussion of electrodynamics and begin discussing a method that enables us to organize some of the mess. Things will still be hairy once we have learned this method, but they will be considerably less hairy than we would be if we attempted to solve the same problem by straightforward means. Okay. Thus, I begin the topic that will occupy us certainly for the remainder of this lecture, all of the next lecture, and possibly the beginning of the lecture after that, but which is very useful in doing complicated problems of this kind, the topic of functional integrals. Or, as it is sometimes called, integration over function spaces or integrations over infinite dimensional spaces. We all know how to do integrals over a one-dimensional space and over an n-dimensional space. I'm now going to take n to infinity. Before I do this, I should ask, are there any questions at this stage about what I have gone through up till now? Yes? Well, the. I just wanted to indicate that the problems you get by eliminating A naught are very similar in structure to the problems that arose when there was a derivative interaction. You have to eliminate A naught when you set things up in Hamiltonian form. Eliminating it means it has a term in it that is proportional to a canonical momentum. 
just like d naught phi is, is a canonical momentum. And therefore, we'll run into exactly the same problems if we attempt to compute the propagator of a mu with a mu that we did when we attempted to compute the, the contraction of a mu with a nu that we did from d mu phi with d nu phi. Also, the mu squared a naught squared term, which appears in the Hamiltonian density because it's there in the Lagrangian, will induce a j naught j naught term in the Hamiltonian density with no ji ji term to go along with it. Okay? So we'll have the two problems that are rather, I don't want to go through the details, but it's clear you will get similar problems in this case that you did in the case I worked out in detail. Is that a satisfactory answer? Now, so for the moment, indeed for the next hour of lecturing, not all of which will occur today, for the next hour of lecturing, we will put aside the vector fields and their associated problems and talk about what will in the first instance be a pure topic in mathematics, butcher grade, the way physicists do it, <laughs> and then, and then uh, we'll eventually come back and develop a bunch of techniques using this mathematical method that will help us unravel things in this problem. I begin with a simple one-dimensional integral, a Gaussian. Where A is a real number greater, oops, sorry, haha, -ha, uh, times two pi to the one half. <laughs> hmm? Yes, in units where pi is, two pi is one. <laughs> <laughs> two pi. One over two pi, known as one bar. So, anyway. <laughs> 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 uh, this is a trivial integral obtained, of course, by the standard Gaussian and rescaling the, uh, the variable A. And by, in fact, by analytic continuation, it is obviously true whenever the integral converges, that is to say, it can be a complex number as long as its real part is greater than zero. We can also do the n-dimensional version of this integral. If I take some symmetric matrix A and define x A x as sum A B equals 1 to n, x a, a a b, x b, then uh, by going to a frame, if a is real and symmetric, by going to a frame where a is diagonal, by making a, by making a, uh, a orthogonal transformation to diagonalize a, I instantly find that dx, e to the minus 1 half dnx, x equals 2 pi to the mo uh, plus n over 2 times the product of the square roots of the eigenvalues of a, which is, of course, determinant a to the minus 1 half. Again, I presume a famous integral. And <coughs> this is proved by direct diagonalization of the matrix, providing the eigenvalues are all positive. If that is to say, providing x a x is greater than zero for every x, or and by analytic continuation is also true if the real part of this thing is greater than zero, which is enough to make the integral converge. Uh, these two pi's are troublesome, and therefore I will introduce a notational convention. I will write define dx equals dnx over 2 pi to the n over 2, and write this integral as integral dx e to the minus 1 half xax equals determinant a the minus one half. 
Are there any questions about this, the notation I have adopted here? Just a general formula for a Gaussian integral. Of course, if we can do a Gaussian integral, we can do a general quadratic form by shifting the integration. If I consider a quadratic form, q of x equals 1 half x a x plus x b, where b is some real n vector, plus c, which is a constant. That's the most general quadratic form in n variables. I can write this in terms of its minimum value at some point where this is stationary, which I'll call x bar and compute in a moment, plus 1 half x minus x bar a x minus x bar, expanding it out in power series since it is a quadratic for form. It only has um, quadratic terms since this is the minimum point. And thus I find that integral dx e to the minus q of x equals e to the minus q of x bar, that's a constant which I will shortly compute, times the remaining integral, which is determinant a to the minus 1 half. x bar and q of x bar are, of course, easy to compute. There's no trick to minimize a quadratic function. x bar obeys the equation ax bar plus b equals 0, or x bar equals a inverse b, and therefore q minus, thank you, and therefore q of x bar equals <coughs> minus 1 half b a inverse b plus c. The first term and the second term almost canceling, but the second term overwhelming the first. <clears throat> the, uh, once we can do a general quadratic form, we can do a, um, a polynomial times a generalized Gaussian. For example, if I have any polynomial in x, integral dx, p of x, e to the minus q of x. Well, one way of getting p of x is to take integral dx p of minus the gradient with respect to b. That is, whenever I see a component of x, x1, x2, or x17, I differentiate with respect to the same component of b. That drags an x down. e to the minus q of x. Equals, but I can bring that outside. p of minus d by db. e to the minus q of x bar. Determinant a the minus one half. So I have told you something you no doubt already know, although perhaps in a somewhat more compressed notation than you are used to, how to integrate Gaussians, generalized Gaussians, and polynomials times generalized Gaussians. <coughs> I um, will turn out for uh, later purposes that it is um, it can be convenient to integrate also over functions of not only real n vectors but complex n vectors. When I say a complex n vector, integrating over a complex n vector, I don't have anything um, fancy in mind involving um, contour integrals or anything like that. I just mean integrating over the real part and then integrating over the imaginary part. And um, in particular, I'll take a complex n vector and break it up into a real and imaginary part. 
with the square root of 2 for reasons that will become clear shortly and have something to do with field theory where similar square roots of 2's appeared when you decompose a complex field. And uh, I will define the symbol dz, dz star to mean simply dx dy whence it follows for example that integral dz dz star e to the minus inner product z star I'll put the z star in there explicitly in this notation az <coughs> equals well it's pretty trivial you diagonalize a then you write z in terms of x and y the one half comes in automatically as I've arranged matters I simply have one integral for the x and one integral for the y. So if each eigenvalue occurs twice, and I get determinant a to the minus 1 rather than determinant a to the minus 1 half. And similar formulas follow for general quadratic forms and polynomials times quadratic forms. Now, everything on the right-hand board is dead simple, but people may be confused by my notation. So if you are, please ask questions. Yes? Oh, well, for example, integral x1, x5, assuming we're at least in a five-dimensional space, dx, e to the minus q of x, equals ddb1 with a minus sign minus d by db5 e to the minus q of x bar determinant a to the minus one half. Okay, I get an x1 by differentiating in q with respect to b1. I get an x5 by differentiating with respect to, to b5. Okay, does that make explicit what was implicit? I just write it for shorthand this way, but I think the specific example shows that it's... <coughs> Now, at this moment, there comes the big leap of faith. <laughs> I have arranged all the formulas on the right-hand board so that the dimension of n, never of the space in which I'm vector space in which I over which I'm integrating, never appears explicitly. <laughs> Therefore, I'm going to simply extend these formulas to an infinite dimensional space. Okay. Guts. Okay, it's good. <laughs> Plunge in. We're just going to say these formulas define integrals over of Gaussians and polynomials times Gaussians, which will turn out to be practically everything we will need to do over an infinite dimensional space. Instead of this running through, everything is exactly the same, except instead of this running from 1 to n, it runs from 1 to infinity. Okay. Now, Obviously, this involves deep and subtle mathematical questions about which I will say nothing. <laughs> More generally, you start out with an infinite dimensional space, a Hilbert space of some sort. You have a quadratic form on it defined by some infinite matrix, some positive definite operator. That's completely legitimate. And then you take that infinite dimensional space and you look at a finite dimensional subspace. In that finite dimensional subspace, you can compute the integral just restricting yourself to a finite dimensional subspace and you can compute the determinant. Absolutely no problem there. And then you let the finite dimensional space get larger and larger until it fills out the whole space, adding basis vector after basis vector one at a time. If there's a limit of the integral, it'll be the limit of the determinant. If there isn't, that's our bad luck. <laughs> It's a deep question which we leave for the mathematicians to determine 
for which quadratic forms the limit of the integral exists and the limit of the determinant exists. Also, it's a deep question which we leave to the mathematicians about if it exists for one way of filling up the Hilbert space, does it exist for another choice of basis vectors where you fill it out in another order? We'll just leave that and blithely manipulate equations, realizing that everything will be OK unless something goes wrong. <laughs> if we can compute the integral, no doubt it can be rigorously shown it exists. If we get zero or infinity or something like that, then we're going to be in trouble. And we'll try and avoid that sort of thing. Since we're going to apply these things to field theory, of course, we will get zero or infinity an awful lot of the time. But those will just be our old, old friends, the ultraviolet divergences, coming up again. And we can get rid of them by cutting off the theory in any one of the standard ways. Yes, sir? Same thing. Same thing. Any f space of all functions on four space, for example, mm -hmm. are on, on a line. Space of all functions on a line can be turned into a discrete space by expanding the function, say, in terms of harmonic oscillator wave functions. Likewise, for the space of all functions in n dimensions, by turning that into a. Uh, okay. So there's no difference between a discretely infinite Hilbert space and a continuously infinite Hilbert space. That's just the difference between a discrete basis and a continuum basis. <coughs> now, there are two points I want to make. One was stolen from me for, by that question, but I'll come back to it in a second. The first point I want to make is that the sort of space over which these integrals are defined is a very big space. <laughs> In fact, precisely how big it is doesn't matter. You can make it large, you can add, it could be a Hilbert space, it could be a bigger space, the space of all continuous functions. It hardly matters when you do the integral because uh, this exponential damping, if you throw in too many too basis vectors that are too bad from one point or another, the exponential damping will cut them out. They'll make a zero contribution to the integral. That was a remark I shouldn't have made because it confused everyone. Forget it. Just to emphasize how big it is, I will consider an infinite dimensional space and consider the simplest possible Gaussian integral. X, X for the identity operator. Okay. That integral is, of course, already diagonal. So it's product R equals 1 to infinity. Integral dxr over 2 pi e to the minus xr quantity squared over 2. Or, as our formulas tell us, 1, the determinant of the product of all the eigenvalues of the identity operator. Now let's consider a function which is not a polynomial. I will consider the step function localized on a gigantic box. I will define theta l of x to equal 1 if xr is less than or equal to l, where l is some positive number for all r, and equals 0 otherwise. That is to say, this is a step function that is equal to 1 inside a gigantic box of size 2l and equal to 0 elsewhere. Now let me consider integral dx theta L of x e to the minus 1 half x comma x. This, of course, e also easily done. x1, x2, x3 is product r equals 1 to infinity integral minus L to L dxr over root 2 pi e to the minus 1 half xr squared. Now, what is this quantity? Well, each of these terms, infinite terms, is identical. Each of them is a little bit less than 1, no matter how big L is, as long as I'll take an infinite product of terms, each of them, well, you know, 3 quarters or 7 eighths or 15 16, you always get the same answer. 
is zero. <laughs> so this integral is completely well defined and is zero. Function space is so big that if we use this thing to define a measure on function space, it's a positive functional, it defines a measure, it gives a volume to every set, then the measure of a box of side L is zero. <laughs> That's a set of measure zero, like the rational numbers inside the real numbers with ordinary Lebesgue measure. <laughs> it's a very big space. We should be warned about that. <laughs> yes, sir? What sort of curve mutation limit? I mean, how continuous is algebraic continuous? That's right. No. <laughs> hmm? There are lots of integrals where the limit isn't continuous. The integral of e to the minus epsilon x squared doesn't have a continuous limit as epsilon goes to zero. <laughs> I mean, you think for a Riemann integral, you think the limit is zero. No. No. I mean, it's just it's, it's there's a lot more outside than inside. <laughs> The integral of all of space is is zero. If I, the integral of all, of, so I put it. If I take a slice on a line, I've got two outsides and you know a little bit of inside. If I put a box in a plane, I have a lot more outside compared to inside. If you'll pardon the expression, because I got all this stuff here. If I take a cube, I've got even more. I'm comparing infinite quantities, which is dumb. But if I take a cube, I have even more outside than inside. When I go up to an infinite dimensional space, I've got hardly any inside at all compared to outside. <laughs> uh, yes? I, I think what he's worried about there is letting L go to infinity. That would give you the wrong integral. The yeah. limits do not commute of letting, letting the space go to infinity and letting the operator. I think, well, I think the reason is um, that depends on how big you want to say the space is. But um, yes, if you define, you can make a. You, yes, that is true. The union of all the boxes is not the whole space in a funny sense. But. Hmm? I'm, I don't want to get into questions like that point, like that. I just wanted to warn people of dangers. <laughs> I really don't know the answer. I'm not that familiar with the mathematically rigorous theory of functional integrals. So you get the right answer taking the, uh, the laws of infinite products and then dividing the sum of the If you let the space go, if you let the space, look, you want to know what they really do rigorously? They worry about their fundamental sets in the sense of the same sense, of the same role that is played by Borel sets in the set of finite dimension of Lebesgue integration is played by what are called cylinder sets, which are boxes that are finite in a certain, for, for, for a finite number of variables and extend infinitely for other variables. And that's how they really define the measure, by first defining it on cylinder sets and then defining it on sets that are unions of, and intersections of cylinder sets. I just wanted to make this point. I'm sorry I didn't. Uh, <laughs> it's, only, it's only the pressure of time. People want to talk about, I'm happy to talk with people privately or at the beginning of the next lecture, but I want to make two other points before I let you go. Um, here I have used an infinite dimensional space as a, um, described in terms of a discrete basis. But I could equally well, of course, define an infinite dimensional space in terms of a continuum basis, as came out in an answer to an earlier question. For example, the space I could deal with would be, could be the space of all functions defined on four space as a Hilbert space. I could expand that into a four space or 17 space. It will turn out to be four space in our, <laughs> in our typical example. And I could define the quadratic form, q of phi, calling it phi instead of x, is one half integral d4x, d4y, phi of x, a of xy, where that's an integral kernel, phi of y, plus integral d4x, b of x, phi of x, plus some number c. 
That's the same sort of thing. If I take these functions phi of x and this expand them in a discrete basis, I will end up here with an infinite dimensional matrix, here an infinite dimensional vector, and here is still a good old zero dimensional number. And I could go through all my integration formulas. They would, you know, at least formally make sense, although, of course, whether they actually make sense would depend upon how astute I was in choosing this object A. I will now explain a fundamental formula, which I will give you in a form only partially defined and which I will prove next lecture. The formula in its first instance, the form I will prove it at the beginning of the next lecture is this. Let us take a theory of a single scalar field, that's the first one I'll talk about, with non-derivative interactions and with an interaction with an external current phi j. <clears throat> let us define, this is a classical field, and let us define the classical action, which is a phi and j, d4x, S of phi and j. Oh, sorry, L of phi and j. This is a classical function of a numerical valued function that depends on two classical functions, phi of x and j of x. You give me a phi of x, you give me a j of x, I with considerable labor, depending on how strange their forms are, will compute this integral and deduce this number, S of phi and j. In the quantum theory, obtain from this classical theory by canonical quantization, there is an object z of j which is vacuum s vacuum in the presence of j. You remember it, it gave you a lot of trouble the first semester. It's the generating functional for the Green's functions. I will demonstrate that in a certain sense, which I will make precise next lecture, z of j equals functional integral d phi the precise sense will be for our purposes to every order in perturbation theory. When I expand out in powers of L prime of phi, I will have up here a quadratic form in S, a Gaussian integral, which I know how to do, times polynomials in phi. And I know how to do Gaussians times polynomials, and I will prove order by order in perturbation theory that the right-hand side is equal to the left-hand side. Okay, that is a promise. I will prove that to you, and I will have to make some subsidiary definitions to prove it, but I will prove it. Now, the advantage, I know there's a seminar now, so it's terrible for me to run over 30 seconds. The advantage of doing things this way is that on the right-hand side, left-hand side, we have an object to find the quantum theory with all those commutators that were giving us so much problems. There are no quantum objects appearing explicitly on the right-hand side, just classical fields, which all commute with each other. They're just ordinary C numbers, and I'm integrating over them. This will turn out to be an enormous advantage and enable us to settle with a single stroke of the sword all the problems associated with derivative interactions, superfluous variables, gauge invariants, and so on. But to see the fruit appearing on that tree, you've got to come to the next lecture. I'm sorry I ran over it.